Hello, everybody, and welcome to my presentation today on Making the Connection, the Learning and Performance Link. My name is Anita Bonas, and I'm the Principal Product Manager for Customer Success at Saba Software, but I'm not a software developer. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about myself and why I'm here today to speak to you about learning and performance together. I came to Saba through acquisition from Halogen Software. And if you know Halogen or you knew of Halogen, you know we were a performance management tool. Saba, you probably know as a stellar learning tool. And as we've come together as an organization, we are exploring the connection that we need to make as learning professionals and as performance professionals between our two processes, our technologies, and everything that we deliver for our employees so that we're creating experiences that drive business results. And what we're going to talk about in our presentation today are four key topics. The first is the evolving workplace why we need to care about pivoting our mindsets around learning and performance and bring the two together. Then we're going to talk about some practical ways and business reasons why we need to make this connection explicit for our business and explicit for our workforce. We're going to talk about measuring outcomes that matter to your business and get you thinking about some of those outcomes or metrics or key performance indicators that can help you determine the effectiveness of your learning initiatives in driving performance. And then we'll wrap things up with some real world examples to make it real as you take this back, hopefully, to what you're doing today in your learning organization. So I don't think it's a far stretch to say that our workplace is evolving. Uh, many of our presentations and our breakout sessions here at the CLO Symposium have talked about the need for transformation. And I'm going to illustrate this transformation and this evolution with a real world example. So I graduated from my undergraduate degree 25 years ago. And I remember getting ready to write my final thesis paper uh, and telling my mother that I would never work with computers because I was going to be an HR professional. I wanted to work with people. And so did you note that I work for Saba Software? So transformation has taken place in my own career. I've probably represented the typical Gen Xer with having multiple jobs and multiple areas. And my path is more of a journey and a lattice as it is a ladder. And through my time, I have worked for organizations that are small entrepreneurial businesses, all the way up to IBM Big Blue. I've seen a lot of change from typical and traditional hierarchical process-driven organizations where processes, activities, our learning function is a very homogeneous uh, function that manages change, manages learning experiences, and uh, takes control away from employees in making decisions and then serves up what we need you to be able to do to an actual workplace that is now more connected, more people-centric, and more collaborative. So very much in line with many of the keynotes that we've listened to to date at the conference. And we also know that these challenges in our workplace, and quite frankly to our workforce, is also changing how we, as learning professionals, need to understand the needs of our learners. So I've got some statistics here, compliments of Brandon Hall Group. We do a lot of work with Brandon Hall, uh, and this is from their performance uh, survey research from 2018, where we have identified that over 30% of employees work somewhere other than an office. So how do we reach them? Obviously, learning technology can help, but how do we truly reach and engage them? and have them participate to the same degree of our folks within our offices. We know that we have increasingly impatient learners that don't want to wait for courses or when you're delivering formal training. In fact, 70% of employees cite that they're more likely to seek out information via a search engine than from the learning resource content that you are providing to them. We also know that employees may not recognize when they're given developmental opportunities at work if we're not expressly calling them out as such. In fact, only 32% of employees have uh, reported that there are growth opportunities for them at work. So how do we empower people to be in control of their own learning? And then lastly, we know this full well that much of our learning today, whether we're talking about individual contributors or leaders, much of the learning is done on the job and happens in real world on the job interactions. So we're not going to say learning is changing. Learning has changed. 
Um, I don't think I need to tell you, learning professionals, that what we do and how we deliver learning has changed. I stepped into the learning industry in 2002, and I can tell you there's been much evolution to how we design learning. And we still have, though, the gray zone area of our learning that we have up here, company-driven, compliance-based, event-based, classes and completion, and really making sure that we are uh, training to the knowledge that's required and ensuring that we are acquiring that knowledge and taking it back to the job. That world still exists, coexists with what we see on the green side, where we are increasingly looking for self-driven, personalized, relevant, in the moment, anytime and anywhere, social and collaborative learning experiences, where we take that knowledge and directly apply it to our job in the moment. So I pulled this quote together because I think it explains a lot of the challenges that we face as learning professionals about the modern learner. I want my learning that's relevant to me. I want it to be interesting, and I want it to relate to me in a language that I feel comfortable with. I want it easy to access, wherever I am, whenever I need it, and I want it to help me do better at my job and help me develop in my career. So if you can deliver that, maybe I will take that course. Maybe I will engage with that learning. There's a lot of choice. So one of the strategies that we think that can help us navigate as learning professionals through this world is making the connection for our workforce about the importance of the learning function and developmental activities to performance. And it's not just what we think. Brandon Hall, uh, as well, has reported uh, that organizations recognize that employees need access to information on a daily or weekly basis, or even more frequently than that. In fact, two-thirds of organizations have reported that they know that that is the information requirements for their learners. And if you're not going to serve it up and help them curate those experiences, then they're likely going to go to their friendly search engine, Google, to find the information out for themselves. We also know through research, uh, and Brandon Hall has a great study on this, if you want to go back, it's available on their website, that linking learning to performance improves performance 95% of the time. We're not talking about performance management, though, from the perspective of the old style annual review. Rather, we're talking about the new model of performance management, ongoing performance management, which is a process or a sequence of activities and conversations that's designed to improve the performance of people and teams in your organizations. And we're looking at an ongoing cycle of setting goals, setting expectations, of having conversations and interactions that provide feedback and recognition for when those performance outcomes are positive, when I catch you doing a good job, when I catch you applying something that you've learned, when I see uh, how a stretch assignment is helping you develop in your skills or your capabilities, but also when we make mistakes or when things don't go according to plan, these feedback conversations can help make sure that performance issues are dealt with in the moment in a constructive way that's empowering to the learner and that we course correct any performance issues along the way rather than waiting for the annual review. Underpinning all of this though is an idea and a discussion around development. What are my goals and what development do I need to help me reach those expectations? All circled with a series of ongoing conversations. Now, an important part of this cycle is the role of the manager. We want to empower our employees to participate in these conversations, but we also need managers to be really good performance coaches, really good development coaches. And that is a challenge. That's why it's so important when we talk about leadership development in this digitally driven era that we're shifting mindsets from command and control to mindsets of coach and collaborate in our management. So that layers in some additional challenges for us. We also know, though, that if you do this well in your business, if you are able to drive employee experience, and a lot of our employee experience research tells us that good opportunities that are available for our employees to learn and develop can help drive that sense of satisfaction in the workplace. And when employees are able to contribute or perform in a way where they see a clear line of sight to how their performance is impacting team or organizational performance, then you are more likely to have engaged employees who are more productive and who drive business result. It's what we see here on the screen here between connecting employee experience 
and employee contribution that is behind our new vision at Saba of work like you, helping deliver learning and performance opportunities that really connect the strengths of an individual and of teams to what you want to achieve from a business point of view. So some tips in terms of how we can make that connection, particularly in the era of self-driven learning or learner experience models. Learning experience is not a technology. Learning experience is a strategy. And here are some tips that we have for you in thinking about how you may want to set up your strategy and help communicate the importance and the role of the employee in those conversations. So the first is about setting objectives, performance objectives and development objectives, and having a really clear idea of what success looks like. Next, we want to have conversations where either the employee self-identifies self or has a discussion with a manager or a mentor around what skills or mindsets or competencies do I need to have to meet those objectives? How do I get development if there's any gaps? And then how can I grow my skills beyond just the role I'm in today and where I may want to direct myself in my career? And this prevent, or provides for us a sequence of conversations where we see ongoing learning, where learning is aligned to what we need people to be able to do and where they want to go, and it's integrated into the flow of work. It's not a once-a-year uh, conversation. It's not a compliance-driven uh, learning path that's pushed to you through your technology platform. Rather, it's available. It's something that we take ownership of in an ongoing way. And one of the ways that we can make it even more meaningful for our employees and our workforce is when we personalize those learning experiences. There's a lot of work out there that we can tap into that help us think about ways that we can deliver engaging learning experiences that are scalable, relevant, accessible, and impactful for our people. But I'm going to pause here and talk about relevancy. Uh, I did some work last year with a great author named Jason Lauritsen, and he wrote a book called Unlocking High Performance. I would highly recommend as a learning professional, that's a great bridge to the world of performance management and the importance that we have in that cycle of cultivating high performance and the role of learning and development. We really need to make our learning relevant to the individual. And you note here the words my, my career path, where I want to go what my employer needs me to learn so that I'm able to do my job. My personal agenda, what is important to me, where I'm motivated, what gives me purpose at work, and then what my mentor, the people that I look to as my guideposts, as my career coach, thinks that I should be learning. So it does need to be relevant. And that personalization does matter. It's not just about helping our employees feel good about their learning experiences. Rather, personalization drives tangible business results. Take a look at this slide, maybe pause the video, and you'll see some key points here that maybe you can take back to your organization. But the two I want to highlight is that personalized learning has improved the link between learning and individual performance in 95% of the organizations that Brandon Hall has surveyed. 95%. And personalization has improved the link between learning and organizational performance in 91% of the organizations that Brandon Hall has surveyed. So taking the time to think this through and figure out what it means for you, your learning organization, your workforce will have payback to the performance of your organization and your people. So when we look at measuring what matters and connecting learning to outcomes, one size does not fit all. But it's important that we consider what does success look like so we measure what matters. We talked yesterday in a keynote about how we talk about the values and the benefits of our initiatives, but really we need to sell the vision and track the outcome so that we can prove our case for the importance of L&D to our stakeholders. Individuals and businesses need to see impact, and when we are able to provide that, it's going to elevate our role as L&D professionals within our organization and earn us a seat at those strategic decision conversations where we want to be so that we are delivering learning that has business results and is not just learning for learning's sake and smile sheets. So outcomes measured, there's a variety of outcomes that we can look at where we're linking learning to performance. These are statistics from Brandon Hall. Again, great research report. Um, around what some high-performing organizations are looking at. Uh, individual performance, employee engagement, team effectiveness, business process improvement, rate of knowledge transfer, profitability, retention, revenue growth, et cetera. 
What you don't necessarily see here is a typical Kirkpatrick or Phillips model of ROI, but these are all meaningful business impact measures that we can connect our learning to with some thought. And in making it real, some tips for you to take back to your organizations. I think the first thing that I would like to say, and this is from Fosway Group, is that we should not assume that we know what our employees need to know. We had a great example from um, MUFG around curating content where they went out and they surveyed their business units. They surveyed uh, their subject matter experts to determine if we're gonna curate content so that we start to personalize our learning experience what content would you want? What is relevant to your role? And with that information, they were able to break down their assumptions of what they thought people needed and were able to curate content and serve up experiences that help employees do their jobs more effectively. So great example of the importance of this quote here. And five steps that you can consider to making the change. First, take the time to understand your business, your business drivers, your strategic priorities, not just now, but where the organization wants to be two to three years from now, so you can chart the course to help your employees develop the capabilities that will enable you to meet those objectives. And then we need to embrace a new mindset of what needs to be measured. Smile sheets actually can be effective in these types of scenarios because we want to gauge learner reaction through likes, through shares, through consumption, through having conversations with managers uh, about what was relevant from their learning experience back to their job. We also want to make sure that we are aligning our learning programs and initiatives to what matters to the business. So that if we're making choices around content or we're making choices around experiences and we have limited budgets or we need to make sure that they cover the biggest bang for the buck, that we're doing something in a way that can deliver impact to uh, our stakeholders. And we know that measuring outcomes isn't always easy, but we do not want to measure everything under the sun because busyness is something that we just don't have time for. We want to be able to really measure those outcomes that matter most versus everything that we possibly can. And then if we're not getting the results we're looking for, that's okay because we learn through making mistakes or we learn from situations where the outcome wasn't exactly as we had thought and maybe that presents us new opportunities to be even better. So just in wrapping up, the learning experience, we believe, is inextricably linked to performance outcomes. You say that three times fast. And as the needs of your business and your workforce evolve, so too does our culture of learning. And when we make the connection to what we need people to be able to do and weave development and learning experiences and conversations into our performance conversations, expectations, and even, dare I say, the annual review, then we can start to really truly align the talent of our organization, creating talent agility for our business and enabling us to succeed in the long term. So with that, I'm going to thank you for attending the session. And if you want to learn more, please check out our resources at saba.com page. We've got some great white papers, great blog posts that dive into this topic in a lot more detail and will be hopefully helpful to you on your journey for making the connection between learning and performance. Thank you.